Well, finally, the feathers. I love the feathers. Years ago, I was coming in from uh, the parking lot when I was working at Washington University School of Medicine. I picked up a blue jay feather, put it in my pocket, and happened to be working on a scanning electron microscope that day, and I thought, I'm going to take a peek at that feather. So I prepared it to put it into the scope. And I'll never forget seeing that feather come up at a few thousand magnification uh, under that microscope. I just about fell out of my chair. I thought, maybe I should take off my shoes. I'm on sacred ground. Why did that feather impress me? It impressed me because it was simple enough for me to understand how complicated it was. Does that make sense? You look at a piece of brain under the tissue, and it looks like a piece of fudge that thinks. But the feather has parts and little hooks and things that fit together. Now let's take a look at the feather. A few interesting things about it. It's lightweight and yet strong. But as light as the feathers are on most birds, the feathers weigh more than their bones do. Uh, feathers are waterproof, but they're just not naturally waterproof. They have to be made waterproof. And now we'll find out one of the reasons birds have such a long neck. Uh, this particular bird's an anhanga. You can see them down in Florida. Notice that long serpentine neck. Uh, birds can use that long neck for a lot of reasons, in this case being underwater and kind of sticking their head out. But most birds, located right about here, uh, just above the base of the tail, is a gland called the uropygial gland. And that gland makes uh, oil. And the bird actually takes its beak, and thanks to this long neck and all these vertebrae, manages to get its beak all the way back. It would be like back to my belt back here where I have a battery pack for the microphone. Uh, I've tried it myself. I can get my head about this far and, and no further. And uh, birds are able to get their beak all the way back there. And they pick up oil, and they work the oil into the feathers as they preen the feathers. You see, you just don't want to put feathers on anything without thinking about one big problem, and that's high maintenance. Birds spend about 20, 30 percent of their waking hour in feather maintenance. If they want to put feathers on a T-Rex, how much time do you think the T-Rex is using its big old teeth to groom and rehook all of its feathers? Where does it get the behavioral pattern to do it? Does it have an oil gland? Maybe it doesn't need one because it doesn't have any purpose for the feathers anyway. Now, this particular bird you're looking at is one of the few, it belongs to a group like the cormorants, that do not have a uropygial gland that will oil the feathers, making them waterproof. Therefore, when the anhanga goes in the water, it lets out all the air from its air sacs, its feathers soak right through the way your clothes do when you fall in the swimming pool, and they sink to the bottom. They live in shallow water like the Everglades, you see a very similar bird in Australia called the Australian snake bird. It's just like the anhinga. But they use that to their advantage. They sink to the bottom of the water, and they spear fish down there. They have no tendency to float back up to the top. See, birds have very little body fat, so that's what makes us float. I float about two-thirds of the way out of the water. So anyway, uh, they can sink once they let the air out of the air sacs, and that's a great idea for spear fishing. But what are you going to do when you get out of the water? Well, they crawl out on a log or something like that, and they are unable to fly. Because once those feathers are wetted through, too heavy to fly, like us with wet clothes on, it feels heavy. And they literally hang themselves up to dry, the way you see this bird in the picture is doing, holding their wings out like this. And they have the good sense that when uh, one side is dry, they turn around and do the other. So anyway, feathers are waterproof made waterproof in most birds. Uh, feathers conserve body heat. That's important because birds have high body core temperatures, unlike reptiles, and uh, very high metabolic rates. Uh, can you imagine if somebody hooked a couple of wings on your arm? Do you think you could make your arms go up and down so you could fly? We wouldn't have near enough muscle or energy, even if we had wings that were of appropriate size. So birds are very special in that regard. They need to conserve body heat, and feathers do that very nicely. Feathers excrete waste products and metabolism. Now think about it. I have a feather here. It's a wing feather, uh, primary. And uh, the feather's growing out of the skin, but it's never coming back in again. That makes sense? <laughs> so you have, if you have anything you want to get rid of, throw it in the feather. Uh, it goes out, and that's the end of it. 
Uh, it happens that even the color of some birds is a result of waste products that the bird puts in the feather. Uh, in fact, there's three kinds of color in a bird. And is there anything other than maybe coral fish quite as beautiful as birds when it comes to color and form? Let's look at those three sources of color in a bird. One is the same pigment we have in our skin. It's called melanin. You'll find it in everything from microscopic worms to people. Uh, melanin is a brown, black, or kind of a rufous color pigment. You see it in red hair, brown hair, black hair. And it's widespread in nature. Uh, invertebrates, invertebrates, it's very durable. It often is still present in fossils, so we get some idea of pigmentation in some fossils. So the black and the brown colors, here's a feather here. We can thank melanin for this beautiful darker brown and lighter brown color. But another source of color, as I've already mentioned, is waste products of metabolism. You wouldn't think that would be pretty, but the pink of a flamingo is actually the result of invertebrates that the bird eats that are excreted into feathers. And finally, my favorite source of color in a bird is called a double interference layer. Think of an oil slick on water. All those different colors you see in the oil, that's due to the difference of the refractive index of the oil and the water and how thick the oil is, sort of like a prism. So all these iridescent colors, like that hummingbird in the lower right-hand corner of this block of pictures, is due to optics like prism, light going through a prism. So any color, red, orange, green, blue, indigo, violet, whatever, can all be produced. Now you put all these sources of color in the hands of our creator, and this is what he does. You know what amazes me here, besides just plain beauty? There's not a single example of poor taste. Every bird is magnificent. I mean, I get up in the morning, I put on the tie and the shirt. My wife says, that shirt doesn't go with that tie. She's absolutely right. Uh, I just don't have the, the taste. I know when things look good. I just can't always figure it out myself. And I look at birds and I think, Lord, what a sense of beauty. What an impeccable taste. Imagine, if you will, that we could be transported back in time to the late Jurassic period, say 150 million years ago. This was before many of the famous dinosaurs like Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus, before Mosasaurs and the giant as dark as pterosaurs standing as tall as giraffes. It was a time when dinosaurs, which you call reptiles, lived in the North and South Poles when the earth was uniformly warmer and the continents were still so close together that it was possible to, to walk or float or fly to any of them. India was then connected to Antarctica and Australia instead of Asia. The South American and African continental plates were still connected, though their connection was submerged beneath the shallow sea. And North America could have been connected to Europe, except that Europe was itself a sea of a thousand islands because the oceans were much deeper then. California and Florida did not yet exist, and the North American plate looked like two continents divided by the Western Interior Seaway. Back then, the poles were not both frozen at the same time like they are now. Most of the world was tropical. Winter conditions only existed at the poles and only in winter. In summer, the poles were just as warm as the heat wave that is currently blasting them right now. Antarctica recently got up to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, the warmest it's ever been in recorded human history. And as of this recording, even Siberia is seeing record-setting temperatures of over 110 degrees Fahrenheit without the mile-thick permafrost that we've always had at both poles and somehow still have, at least for the moment. All of our coastal cities would be deep underwater. Paleontologists have described the Jurassic as the best time to be alive because of the extent of biodiversity of both plants and animals on the land or in the sea. There were no eutherians like us, nor metatherians either, but there were several types of egg-laying exotic mammals that I'm sure you've never heard of. There were pterosaurs of many different types, likely just as colorful as birds, and the oceans were host to billions of brilliantly colored ammonites as well as formerly terrestrial reptiles like the ichthyosaurs. A reptilian version of whales, just for one of many examples. Birds were brand new in the late Jurassic, and there weren't very many of them. They all looked like the other dinosaurs, and a lot of dinosaurs looked so much like birds that it would have been pointless to try to distinguish one from the other. If you could see the world that the fossils reveal, you would know that birds are just one of many different kinds of dinosaurs, and that there were lots of other 
absolutely amazing types of animals that you don't that we don't have anymore you don't know anything at all about all living in a pristine paradise more beautiful than on average than anywhere you've ever been if you're impressed by the colorful diversity of modern birds, and just try to imagine how much more splendid everything must have been everywhere you look in the late Jurassic. Well, going on in the feathers, the actual shape of a feather produces lift. If you take a feather like this and you move it through the air, it's like an airplane wing. You can feel the lift. And then there are muscles that control the orientation of particularly these bigger feathers. So this feather would stick in the skin about maybe a half inch or so, and uh, it would have muscles attached to it. And it would have muscles that would allow the feather to be moved forward in the skin, to be moved backwards. It has muscles to elevate the feather and to depress it. And, oh, my favorite. It has spiral muscles in the feather follicle that go around in a spiral pattern, and when they contract, these big feathers open and close like Venetian blinds. Yeah, I got a question for you. How's dumb luck working for you so far? Pretty good, actually. And my understanding of science is working much better than your lame excuses for gods and magic that are not working for you. Use that piece of fudge in your skull and understand that anything being formed from the molecular level will appear staggeringly complex at our scale. That's the nature of anything if you study it long enough or look at it too closely. Because at our size, we lack the ability to work in such fine detail, then maybe you imagine that covalent bonds could only occur when giant fingers use tiny tweezers to push two atoms together. But we don't need a magic invisible man to make that happen. Their chemical properties do all that on their own with no outside involvement necessary. I know you like to pretend that there's a master craftsman, but that's because you're looking at this upside down not realizing that these are patterns of emergence rising from the bottom up, not orchestrated by some imagined administrator calling orders from the top down. Understand that unnecessary complexity is indicative of a haphazard assemblage of incidental designs of any molecular structures rising to the macroscopic level, but especially when you get into the absurdly convoluted systems of biology, like photosynthesis, for example. No intelligent designer would it con would concoct such an elaborate Rube Goldberg contraption as that, particularly not for such a specific task. But that is exactly what we, the sort of unnecessarily complex configurations we expect of evolution, because that's what you get from a, autonomous replicative processes with no hint of forethought and no expectation, goal, or purpose. But the hallmark of an intelligent designer would be the very opposite, an elegant system of efficient simplicity not the grotesque overcomplication that we find throughout biochemistry. You describe what you think are the peculiarities of modern birds, not realizing that those features either do not apply to all birds, especially not to primitive birds, and nor do you realize that much of what you're saying actually does apply to the other dinosaurs. You don't understand that dinosaurs were not the mere reptiles that you were raised to think that they were in the old movies by Ray Harryhausen. We now know that dinosaurs, many of them at least, and pterosaurs too, were warm-blooded, high-energy, long-endurance animals requiring a much higher consumption of food and oxygen than we mammals do, which is ultimately why they're extinct and we're not yet. So when you talk about birds, understand that some dinosaurs were just as marvelous, making uniquely interesting sounds with elaborate courtship rituals and having all manner of decorations just as beautiful with behaviors and adaptations that we may never understand beyond realizing that such a rich level of uninhibited biodiversity would have had to produce at least the range of color and an intricacy that we see in birds today. And ancient times probably went well beyond what little we have left as we bring everything to extinction. The point is that everything that birds are is built on the template of dinosaurs, that birds are just the one set of dinosaurs that managed to survive. And probably because they could fly at least better or more efficiently than other dinosaurs did, and because they were small enough to survive in post-apocalyptic conditions when there wasn't much food. But being the smallest of dinosaurs or the fastest flying dinosaurs doesn't mean that they're not dinosaurs. Nor does it mean that dinosaurs were any less fascinating in every way than the birds that obviously descended from them. This is not your average dinosaur that we're talking about here. 
Well, feathers have to be in an absolute precise left-right arrangement. You can't have more feathers in one side than the other. The poor bird would go like a boomerang through the air. Even the position has to be mirror image left and right. So you can make a map for most birds and you can see that for every feather follicle on the left, there will be one on the right in a mirror image position. And it's not good enough that you have this left-right symmetry in the position of all of the feather follicles. In addition, the feathers must molt in left-right matched pairs. So when a feather is released from the right, one in a mirror image position from the left has to release at the same time to preserve left-right symmetry. What kind of a crater do we have? What are his limits? There are none. What are his properties? There are none. What is the evidence for this mystic creator of yours? Again, there is none. Why would you even imagine that this magic imaginary friend of yours had anything to do with this when there was never any reason to assume such a thing? One of the most basic elements of natural selection as it applies to virtually uh, any animal you can think of is that we have genes, not magic, governing bilateral symmetry. Birds, dinosaurs, makes no difference. The same genetic rules apply. Yet, despite your biology degree, you seem to be unaware of even that. Speaking of which, where did feathers ever come from? Of course, evolutionists say, just like the birds themselves, it was sort of random chance, mutations, natural selection. Uh, we had answers in Genesis, are pretty sure. <laughs> We're convinced it's intelligent design of a wonderful creator. And he's told us that he created the birds. No, your God never told you anything. You're referring to a compilation of fables, folklore, myths, and legends that were all written by mere fallible men. You don't have the word of God. You have the baseless speculation of ignorant primitives who obviously had no idea what they were talking about. And you're denying every field of scientific study to make believe in your alternate reality based on alternative facts. Though you have closed your mind to anything that is evidently true and are either unwilling to reason or are incapable of reasoning, I must correct some of the misunderstandings that you're spreading with this speech of yours, which I trust you will never give again because absolutely every point you tried to make where you attempted to distinguish birds from dinosaurs was demonstrably wrong. And you can't correct it without admitting that birds are dinosaurs. The first feathers were, of course, the simplest, just hair-like follicles that provide minimal insulation and could also be used as sensory apparatus to detect the motion and temperature of wind and so on. And soon these could be raised the same way that uh, animals can raise their hackles, what, what he, we humans call goosebumps, where if we still had our fur, we would see it standing on end. And these tiny hair-like pycnofibers have also been found on a number of primitive dinosaurs as well as pterosaurs too, so that trait evidently emerged before these two groups diverged. But the structure of these follicular pycnofibers offered more versatility than mammals can get out of mere hair because feathers can develop into hard conical spikes. And the way they do that can also unwind into soft fronds following a recurrent pattern like a Mendelbrot set in which a formula can be very simple and create a universe of bottomless complexity. So many different designs are possible should mutations interrupt to elaborate or inhibit feather development at any stage. Consequently, as the first dinosaurs became increasingly distinct from each other, leading to more and more distantly related groups, some of them either lost their downy fluff or only kept it on tiny hatchlings. Others developed different types of feathers than we see on birds today. For example, my emu had a very different type of feather than any other bird I'm aware of, being two fronds coming off of one shaft, looking more like the leaf clusters on a weeping willow and without any of the barbules and all of that. Similarly, primitive birds and other dinosaurs developed very different feather types than just the ones we see in modern birds today. And one of the interesting varieties are the evidence of what looks like just spiky quills on the backs or tails of some ceratopsians, whereas theropods have the softer fronds leading to several types, including eventually bird feathers. And we'll talk more about the history of feather formation as revealed in both embryology and paleontology in the next episode.